In the opening years of the 20th century, the Rockefeller dynasty stood as an unassailable pillar of American affluence and influence. Furthermore, their palatial estates sprawled across prominent landscapes from the bustling heart of New York to the sun-kissed shores of Florida and the opulent retreats in Newport. These were not merely homes, but grandiose statements of wealth and architectural prowess. However, the looming shadow of the Great Depression would come to eclipse even these illustrious sanctuaries, compelling the family to part with many of their treasured possessions. In today's episode of Old Money Mansions, we'll guide you through the riveting narrative of these lost Rockefeller mansions, telling the full saga of why these lavish homes were relinquished, what transpired in the aftermath of their sales, and whether the parting was a mere financial exigency, or an emblematic shift in the American social class system. First on our list we enter the John D. Rockefeller mansion. But first, a quick history lesson. You see, in the 1860s, amidst the chaos of the Civil War, Fifth Avenue and 54th Street in Manhattan remained a barren stretch of land, until William P. Williams, a prosperous merchant, would choose this location to construct a lavish brownstone mansion at 4 West 54th Street in 1864. Indeed, the mansion was an elegant abode, an embodiment of Williams's prosperity and an early marker of the neighborhood's potential. Simultaneously, in the southern charm of Richmond, Virginia, Catherine Yarrington managed a boarding house to support her family following her husband's demise. Among her five children was a 19-year-old Arabella, a young woman who radiated beauty and had a penchant for inviting drama into her life. Her life took a significant turn when Collis P. Huntington, a married New York railroad magnate, initiated a passionate relationship with her. Subsequently, the Yarrington clan relocated to the Big Apple in 1869. After this, Arabella soon had a child, Archer Worsham, whose paternity was a subject of much gossip. The general consensus, though unverified, was that Archer was indeed Huntington's son. With a newfound financial cushion, Arabella secured the brownstone mansion at 4 West 54th Street. Though the home showed signs of architectural aging, she was thrilled. It was situated in one of Manhattan's most coveted districts. However, Arabella yearned for something more than mere high society prestige. She envisioned a complete metamorphosis, not just of her social standing, but also her living space. Money being no hindrance, she spearheaded a full-scale renovation, employing top-notch decorating firms of the time, such as George A. Shasti or Potier and Stymus. Stepping into Arabella's home was like entering a realm of fantasies. It boasted a Turkish bath, a Japanese bedroom with ebonized woodwork, and a dazzling chandelier crafted in silver and gilt. The smoking room was a spectacle of Moorish charm. Ceilings featured intricate designs, mantles showcased exotic woodwork. While artisans labored to perfect each detail, Arabella and her young son ventured on international excursions, returning to an abode completely altered in both form and spirit. Yet Arabella, always the shrewd entrepreneur, decided to sell the mansion following her husband's death. John D. Rockefeller, the legendary oil tycoon, would soon acquire the property, marking the inception of another chapter in the mansion's storied existence. Sadly, its architectural splendor was not universally appreciated. John D. Rockefeller Jr. salvaged two rooms for museums in New York, but the rest of the house faced the wrecking ball, unable to align with modern architectural sensibilities. The final act for the mansion came when Abby Rockefeller, John's spouse, co-established the Museum of Modern Art's Sculpture Garden on its grounds. The mansion's rich and multifaceted past gradually receded, marking the end of a unique chapter in the story of Victorian domestic architecture. At the number two slot in our historic inventory, Rockwood Hall emerges as a paragon of the Gilded Age, a remarkable residence in Mount Pleasant, New York. Established in 1849, the mansion's lineage included distinguished individuals such as Alexander Slidell Mackenzie and William Henry Aspinwall. However, its transformation into a veritable palace occurred under the ownership of William Rockefeller, John D. Rockefeller's brother. William expanded the mansion to an awe-inspiring 204 rooms, establishing it as the second largest private residence in America during his lifetime. And the architectural grandeur of Rockwood Hall didn't just remain confined within its walls, it served as the conceptual blueprint for the Sacred Heart Academy in Cincinnati, Ohio. Designed by Thomas Sargent, this academy took shape between 1864 and 1867 as the residence of William C. Neff. 
As years rolled on and the Rockefellers influence waned, the mansion experienced a shift in purpose. Transformed into a country club, it eventually spiraled into bankruptcy amid the financial ruin of the Great Depression. Subsequently, John D. Rockefeller Jr. gained control of the property, demolishing a majority of the mansion in 1942. Before its incorporation into Rockefeller State Park Preserve, the mansion passed through a series of custodians, including tech giant IBM. What remains today is but a fragment of its former self, a nostalgic gatehouse and terraced foundations, remnants that tell the tale of an age of luxury and ambition along the Hudson River. Architectural features that set Rockwood Hall apart included a towering four-story structure at the mansion's southeast corner, a two-and-a-half-story octagonal tower, and an elegant porte cochere that seamlessly connected the two. The mansion reveled in lavish verandas and a stone-roofed patio that hugged its perimeter. Its roof was a work of art, adorned with red-tiled firebrick and crowned with an ornate gilded weathervane. Inside, the mansion was an epitome of finery. The first floor was a microcosm of opulence, home to an entrance hall, drawing room, library, music room, and various other chambers designed for leisure and refinement. Mosaic floors, walls crafted from American oak, and intricately designed papier-mâché ceilings greeted the eye at every turn. The grand staircase, adorned with an American oak balustrade, was a spectacle unto itself, crowned by a glorious dome of cathedral glass. But its innovations weren't limited to visual aesthetics. Advanced features like floorboard vents for heating and electric buttons for calling servants imbued the mansion with a forward-thinking sensibility. Fire safety was paramount, as evidenced by fireproof construction and sliding doors in nearly all rooms. Additionally, landscape architect Frederick Law Olmsted complemented the mansion's structural beauty with lush external environs. Rolling hills, scenic woodlands, meadows, and artistically designed gardens enriched the mansion's surrounding acreage. Today, Rockwood Hall remains an evocative relic, a cherished vestige of an age of unprecedented luxury and technological advancement, where the whispers of a grand past are carried by the Hudson River breezes through what remains of its noble structure. Nestled in the lush landscapes of Harnett County, North Carolina, Overhills holds the third spot on our roster. Once an expansive 17,000-acre haven, it was a cherished jewel in the Rockefeller family estate. Over time, it evolved, embodying a range of roles and interpretations. Now, the architectural panorama of Overhills was a spectacle in and of itself. Here we delve into some of the cornerstone edifices that mark this verdant enclave. First, the Croatan Cottage, a stately two-story colonial revival residence. Croatan Cottage was the epitome of architectural prowess. Created by the distinguished New York design firm Hiss & Weeks, it instantly became a landmark in Overhills. The residence boasted a sprawling layout, complete with a flagstone terrace, an informal garden, and unobstructed vistas of the adjoining golf course, capturing the essence of Gilded Age grandiosity. Next, the original clubhouse of the estate was more than just a building. It was the social hub, designed to cater to the indulgences of the elite who graced Overhills. While its precise architectural elements might be varied, the overarching ethos was consistent, a blend of period-specific charm and timeless elegance. Additionally, scattered across the property were an assortment of lodges and cottages, each contributing a unique architectural nuance. Designed with meticulous attention to detail, these accommodations seamlessly integrated with the natural environment while providing the pinnacle of comfort to visitors. The estate showcased a variety of architectural styles, resonating both with the Rockefeller family's preferences and the prevailing design norms. Among these, the colonial revival style was particularly dominant, identifiable by its grand columns and symmetrical arrangements. However, Overhills was also a melting pot of architectural influences, incorporating a multiplicity of styles that added layers of complexity to its visual appeal. While not a building, the Donald Ross-designed golf course was another art form manifest in the estate. The course was a masterpiece, intricately laid out to offer golf enthusiasts an unparalleled experience. From the strategic bunkering to the well-contoured greens, every facet of the course was a calculated design choice, woven into the scenic backdrop of Overhills. Far more than its architectural features, Overhills possessed an undercurrent of deep historical resonance. 
Over the decades, its identity transitioned from a secluded haven for the Rockefellers to a significant military institution. This metamorphosis narrates a multifaceted story, marking divergent epochs in the estate's storied existence. Occupying the fourth slot in our chronicle of historical marvels is Abbeyton Lodge, originally known as the Playhouse. Nestled within the expansive grounds of the Pocantico Center, the Lodge serves as a hub for a myriad of activities and initiative, each resonating with the philanthropic spirit of the Rockefeller Brothers Fund. Renamed in 2018, Abbeyton Lodge embodies the values of unity and progressive philanthropy, reflecting the ambiance of the Rockefellers' early abode. Interestingly, the tale of Abbeyton Lodge finds its roots in an earlier structure of the same name. This quaint wooden establishment, gracefully situated downhill from Kikuit, the residence of John D. Rockefeller and Laura Spellman Rockefeller, marked a cherished familial gift in 1901. Picture a home adorned with oak panelling and flooring, radiating a warmth that welcomed anyone who entered its domain. For years, the lodge was the heartbeat of the Rockefeller family, a sanctuary where five sons and daughters grew, laughed and shared life's many highs and lows. However, the tide of time turned in 1937 when the senior Rockefeller passed away. John and Abby relocated to Kikuit, leaving the original lodge largely uninhabited for nearly 10 years. Despite its dormancy, the wooden edifice demanded continual maintenance. With none of the offspring returning, the lodge faced an inevitable demolition in 1946. Yet the essence of Abbeyton Lodge was too potent to be forgotten. In 1987, younger generations revived its spirit by forming Abbeyton Lodge, Incorporated, a not-for-profit entity aimed at orchestrating family gatherings and social events. But in 1924, an effort to immortalize the family legacy was undertaken by John D. Rockefeller, Jr. He enlisted architect Duncan Candler to create a playhouse, echoing the architectural elegance of the original lodge. This Tudor-style masterpiece, finished in 1927, stands as an enduring tribute to the Rockefeller family's dedication to their lineage. Inside the modern-day Abbeyton Lodge, you are greeted by a stone-floored lobby punctuated by portraits of the Rockefeller patriarch and matriarch. Further in, an intimate card room beckons, its chairs ornamented with needlepoint craftsmanship, courtesy of Abbey Aldrich Rockefeller. The indoor pool area is a feast for the eyes, its walls and floors adorned with vibrant Mexican Talavera tiles. The adjacent gallery houses a grand fireplace and architectural relics from the family's Gilded Age residence in New York City, each element contributing to the rich narrative of the space. Today, the stewardship of Abbeyton Lodge is undertaken by the National Trust for Historic Preservation, operated by the Pocantico Center under the auspices of the Rockefeller Brothers Fund. Bequeathed by David Rockefeller, this majestic venue continues its philanthropic mission, ensuring that its legacy will be cherished by future generations. And the final narrative in our exploration of historic mansions unfurls like a romance novel brought to life. Picture this, it's June 1924, and the SS Homeric is setting sail for the Paris Olympics. On board is James Stillman Rockefeller, the charming Yale crew team captain. While the ship offers him a rigorous practice schedule by day, it also provides resplendent dance nights to enjoy. Amidst this whirlwind of athleticism and glamour, James finds himself utterly captivated by Nancy Carnegie, a vivacious debutante and the granddaughter of steel magnate Andrew Carnegie. As fate would have it, their connection deepens against the backdrop of James's gold medal victory in rowing at Paris. Fast forward a year, and the couple's love story crescendos into a grand wedding at the Carnegie Estate on Cumberland Island, Georgia. A sprawling 11-acre plot in Greenwich, Connecticut, becomes their wedding gift and the canvas upon which they would paint their lifelong dreams. With the same spirit that guided them through their whirlwind courtship, they embarked on an architectural adventure, enlisting Auguste Noel and George McCulloch Miller, the minds behind the iconic Whitney Museum. What emerged was Rockfields, a 19,000-square-foot Georgian-style marvel dressed in rich red brick. Imagine soaring ceilings, multiple fireplaces, a pantheon of bedrooms, and a living room featuring expansive windows that provided panoramic views of an English boxwood garden and a wisteria-laden gazebo. As the decades turned, Rockfields bore witness to the rhythms of time. Three years following James's death in 2004, the property transitioned into the care of a financier who invigorated it with modern touches. 
The mansion found its next chapter in 2009, with owners enamored by aesthetics and the arts. For these stewards, the mansion's magnetic allure was palpable from the first glimpse of its winding driveway. Renovations were imminent but carefully planned. An extensive landscape overhaul introduced 53 new maple trees and a rejuvenated gazebo. In came architects Timothy Haynes and Kevin Roberts, renowned for transforming spaces into artistic marvels, and the renovations were nothing short of transformative. The foyer saw its red-orange American cherry floor give way to a checkered pattern of deep burgundy marble and cream French limestone, a nod to the grandeur of British estates. The formal dining room was reimagined with antiqued mirrored walls, enveloping the space in a soft, inviting glow. Furthermore, illumination assumes a crucial role throughout the home, and the owners, with their eclectic artistic tastes, integrated dynamic light features and vibrant panels from the Mearsburg Hunts of Maximilian, a 16th century treasure. While the renovations added modern flair, they also respected the mansion's rich history, original blueprints from 1929, and a long-since deactivated telephone switchboard serve as nostalgic touchpoints. Thus, the experience of being in Rockfields is almost ethereal. Each door, heavy with the weight of history, opens to reveal corners imbued with stories from the past, making this mansion a living, breathing monument to enduring love and timeless elegance. And now we'd like to see you in the comments. If you could bring back one of the lost Rockefeller mansions, which one would it be? We have our personal favorite, but we'll wait to hear from you first. Thanks again for your continued viewership, and cheers until next time.